Okay. So uh, we are continuing our coverage of the 30 essays in the Abolition for the People series by Kaepernick Publishing. Uh, this one is the 26th of 30. Um, so we're coming into the home stretch. It's written by Andrea Ritchie. Um, she has spent 20 years uh, in doing activism, legal services, organizing research into uh, primarily the subject of abuse and discrimination by police against um, uh, women, lesbians, uh, LGBT f folks in general, um, people of color. Um, specific emphasis on uh, discrimination against women and trans women, though. So, um, I linked a book that she wrote in the Discord earlier uh, called Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color. Um, so, yeah. Let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, as always, if you are new here, uh, these are intended as a discussion. Uh, as I'm reading this, I will be interjecting my own thoughts, uh, and you're encouraged to do the same. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's part of just learning about this stuff and, uh, and discussing it. So, yeah. Ending the War on Black Women Building a world where Breonna Taylor could live um, Victory will not be achieved through prosecutions, but through transforming the conditions of violence by Andrea Ritchie The outcry in response to Breonna Taylor's murder by the Louisville Metropolitan Police Department is indisputably unprecedented I have never in my two and a half decades of organizing to end police violence against black women seen billboards, mainstream magazine issues, celebrities, or an entire basketball season dedicated to demanding justice on behalf of a black woman killed by police. Police violence against black women is, at least to some degree, indeed invisible no more. The thing is, visibility is only the starting point not the end game. The goal is a world where Breonna Taylor would still be with us. A world where black women aren't the group most likely to be killed by police when unarmed, the women most likely to experience arrest or use of force during a traffic stop, the fastest growing arrest, uh, prison and jail populations. The goal is a world where cops like Daniel Holtzclaw don't target black women, queer, and trans people for sexual violence. The goal is a world where black women don't face the highest levels of domestic, sexual, and community violence alongside native women. So, um, just as a brief, very, very brief uh, recap, I suspect most people know about the situation with Breonna Taylor. Um, but it is a situation where they decided to, uh, even though they did not have a warrant on her, were not, were not investigating her, but like her ex, uh, the police kicked into, they were breaking into her apartment where she and her boyfriend were. Um, and just opened, uh, fire when allegedly her boyfriend fired a warning shot. They didn't know and had no reason to know that cops were breaking into their house. He legally owned a firearm and was defending his house. And they responded with a hail of bullets, which, uh, you know, killed her. 
Um, and again, they didn't even have a warrant on and were not investigating her. It was someone else. So, um, yeah, just so many things wrong there. Uh, the thing they were allegedly investigating her ex for was drug usage. Um, so again, not even like a violent crime. Um, something that shouldn't even be a crime in the first place, in my opinion. And that's ju that's just a real brief uh, overview. Um, and of course, they uh, insisted that they had done nothing wrong, etc. Um, yeah. Let's continue on. Black women's experiences of policing and safety teach us that abolition is the path that leads us there. Yet overwhelmingly, the primary call of the chorus demanding justice for Brianna is for arrests and prosecutions of the cops who killed her. And as shown by the decision not to indict anyone for her murder, accountability won't come from the system that sent them to her door. Uh, this has always been true, like, the police would have to, in our current system, would have to be in charge of arresting themselves, and they just won't do that. Um, they, like, they do, but it's extremely rare, and only in the face of international pressure uh, do we see police actually arresting other, you know, members of the police. They have no actual system of accountability. Uh, Shaloon, it's crazy to me that our lawmakers have never resolved the contradiction of a right to self-defense and the ability of police to invade homes. It is necessary in rare cases and can be done responsible. Yeah, um... It really, uh, the way it is conducted, the way it's conducted, I would say, is never necessary. There may be circumstances that a breaking into a home may be needed, but the way it's done today, no. Um, the just kick down the doors, shining flashlights, and screaming something. Yeah, technically they're announcing themselves, but... When you have someone kicking down your door, flashing a gun and flashlight around and screaming at you, you don't actually process what they're saying. No, very few people could keep their wits enough to comprehend what's being said and react in any way except for the gut fight-or-flight response. No more than the table you built it on. Yeah, a hostage situation or organized crime. Yeah, I could, I could see something like that. Not to try and find a cache of maybe drugs and also hitting the wrong apartment. <laughs> um... Yeah. Even with that, though, I do wonder, like, I guess it depends on the type of organized crime. I could see a hostage situation, maybe, but even then, hostage situations are so messy that like, that's something you really want um, a negotiator and someone who can handle it calmly to approach. Because if it's a hostage situation and you suddenly kick in the door or do some sort of breach, somebody's going to get killed. Uh, 
with organized crime, it is also really kind of a question like... I could see doing... And this is just me, you know, I... I've become very much a hardliner on this, admittedly. But the fact that we have uh, such a severe sentence on this, where, like, if you kill a cop, it's life in prison. If you're trying to investigate what organized crime is up to, and you have reason to believe they're up to something, even if you just get cops in the door to look around, even if they, you know, do force their way in and, uh, like, through breaking the door down, they don't necessarily even need to be armed. Uh, they just have to be recording. Because if they get killed while investigating and they have their warrant and they're walking in, um, then whatever they were in investigating is irrelevant because now the party they were investigating has escalated it to murder. Um, if one believes that sentencing deters crime, organized crime wouldn't open fire on police. Also, if they know that cops are there investigating re recording or whatnot, they have no reason to open fire anyway. Um, they know they've been caught, they just have to deal with it. I tend to believe that criminals do have a sense of self-preservation. Um, you know, people just... people do. And... Even in the face of investigating organized crime, I can't really rationalize busting in with guns blazing. Now, I'm talking about organized crime as a lot of things that we've seen, but, like, admittedly, things like some of the cartels, maybe, in Colombia, okay, that's where it gets really extreme, um, and maybe that level of force is needed. At that point, you know, it, does it become a National Guard thing? Do we still just, do we still use police? There's a lot of questions. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly, Shalin. Exactly. Yeah, um, situations where various types were a lethal violent group situation. Yeah. But yeah, um, the, the casual way that lethal force is deployed today is absolutely unacceptable. Um, and the complete lack of accountability when it is used is also unacceptable. Yeah, more the rare cases when you have a cartel or mafia with shotguns ready at the door. Yeah. See, as I've thought about it, and, you know, as we've gotten into the this sort of discussion, I think that the actual um, law enforcement side, you know, I, I do I do think that you know community looking after the community is the way to go whether that be like elected members of a community watch in a neighborhood or what have you they become effectively law enforcement we, we invest in rehab we invest in various things to reduce root causes of crime but in situations like what you're describing Shalun I don't think that should be a function of law enforcement. In my estimation, that's actually where... I think it would be a suitable use for something like the National Guard. Um, I do kind of want to separate those militarized takedowns of a militarized opposition out of the hands of routine law enforcement. Um, because otherwise you do have to have your domestic law enforcement force, whatever they are, not only trained at, but 
mentally prepared to take people's lives, and no matter how you cut it, that's going to drive them into not only a place of harming them, but it's going to compromise their ability to prioritize community health. If that makes sense. It's... At least that's my thinking. It also create already intuitively a fan since, uh, yeah, they do tend to be a lot more disciplined and precise than local police and SWAT. Yeah, and it's the kind of thing where it does create kind of a um, mutual check and balance because, like, this sort of thing would come as a result of, you know, whatever you're considering a local community watch law enforcement thing, investigating and finding out about something, and then calling and saying, we don't have the capacity to deal with this. It is an actual violent threat. Now, if the National Guard gets in and actually does the job or something, and it is not what it was advertised to be, you can bet that they would be on whoever called it in and say, look, you sent us after some guys who were just living out in the woods and they had like, you know, sticks. They were growing, um, you know, food or whatever, you know, whatever it is. It, um, they would not be happy about being sent on a deployment that did not meet their mission. Right. So they would actually provide that accountability against each other. Um, I think. I, I don't know for sure. But I would think they would raise hell if they were sent on a bad deployment. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, interdependence. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's see. As Miriam Kaba and I wrote in July for Essence, we want far more than what the system that killed Breonna Taylor can offer, because the system that killed her is not set up to provide justice for her family and loved ones. Families and communities deserve more than heartbreak over and over again each time the system decides to hold or declines to hold itself accountable. Beyond leading to dead ends, calls for prosecutions legitimize the criminal punishment system by promoting the idea that it can do justice in individual cases against cops, a premise that directly undermines our wholesale challenges to its legitimacy on the ground that it is systematically that it systematically defines justice as killing, maiming, raping, caging, and deporting black people. As longtime abolitionists Rachel Herzing and Isaac uh, Ontiveros taught me, if we apply the same logic to the state that we do to ourselves, however, the same questions remain. How does putting an agent of the state in a cage hold the state accountable? How does prosecuting an agent of the state highlight the systemic nature of repression and genocide of black communities and not simply exceptionalize this situation as the result of one bad cop. Appealing to the same system that engineers and executes repression and genocide of poor people, youth, queer communities, and communities of color for remedies only strengthens that system's hold over us. This is something that I grapple with a lot. Now, I do think that until we have some other system in place, we still should demand that our current system do does hold people accountable to the extent it's capable of. Uh, when I say people, I mean cops. But it is a hypocrisy uh, to some degree. 
Yeah, we're going to be talking about that later, Dr. Watson, so if you are interested, stick around. Yeah? Right now, we are on this subject. Calls for police prosecutions offer an illus illusion of justice while reinforcing the status quo. That's why they garner widespread support among people invested in upholding it. Arresting individual cops leaves the conditions that make their violence possible unchanged, and injustices multiply in the absence of effective accountability. Yeah, it, this, this is the difficulty of walking the abolitionist line, because you are... It, it does sting every time something like this happens, because you want to... Putting a cop in a cage isn't going to solve the problem, but it is the only remedy that our current justice system can offer, and only at under great international pressure does it occur but it does not fix the problem um yeah thank you shalin um and it is it's it's very disheartening um uh, But until we actually have some systemic remedy on the table, I uh, understand what she's saying about exceptionalism, but we must hold the accountable, uh, the cops accountable to the point that another, s yeah. Yeah. Um, until we have some other mechanism, this is literally all we have. Uh, I think what I believe is being advocated for is not to lose sight of that, not to fall into the, yes, we got that one killer out mentality and call it a day. And like in the case of Breonna Taylor, even if officers had been held accountable, had been arrested even, many, many people would be satisfied with that. Or at least would fall silent and be appeased because of it. And I believe what um, what Andrea is doing here is a call to greater action and a recognition that that is not enough, even if we do call for it in the moment. Of course, I share deep and fierce outrage at the blatant unfairness of a system that refuses to sanction an officer for murdering a black woman in her home, but will imprison a man for life for attempted theft of lawn shears, lay charges on a pregnant black woman that could put her in prison for three years simply for b voting while on probation, or incarcerate black women and queer and trans people for decades for defending themselves when society won't. But doubling down on trying to make a violent system work for us comes at tremendous costs of fueling the system and of what we could be doing instead. Um, get the sense it is largely speaking to people who are less politically active and aware than most folks who hang out here. That's certainly true. <laughs> Especially given the mainstream attention BLM got. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was a series of essays just shotgunned out into the world, hoping to catch as many, you know, liberal-minded folks as possible and captivate that that energy that that tragic moment actually got. Um, these paragraphs are written elsewhere. So. Abolition. 
Dismantling systems of policing and imprisonment rather than trying to fix them invites us to stop investing our faith, time, energy, and resources in seeking justice from a system that has consistently failed to recognize harm against black women and has consistently perpetrated and then justified it. Imagine what would be possible if all the energy and resources directed towards demanding arrests and prosecutions of the officers who killed Breonna Taylor were instead focused on making a world where she would still be here. As Kaba powerfully puts it, people are tweeting every day about Breonna Taylor, about her death, and what are they saying? When are you going to arrest these people? When are they going to prison? People don't put the question as, when are we going to dismantle that police department? What if instead of acting from a futile hope of justice from the system that killed her, we sought broader and more lasting accountability by working to defund police and build community-based safety strategies that prioritize the safety of black women like Brianna and hundreds of others killed by police or state-sanctioned violence? Yeah, this is, this is very much a call to higher action, basically. She's saying negotiate from the actual position you want to get to rather than capture these sorts of moments only to call for a stopgap. Plenty of people are going to call for the stopgap. Abolitionists need to be negotiating from a further position and arguing from a further position and getting people on board with that. Because if they are, if they are only told arrest this cop, maybe they'll occasionally throw, uh, throw a bone and arrest a cop. If they start seeing mass demands to shut down police departments, there's going to be other questions raised, and there's going to be. Um, other negotiations that happen. <laughs> um, I can understand that. It's the same sort of thing where, say, you're, um, you know, in Congress and you want a substantial infrastructure bill. Do you start by haggling down to what you think could be accepted? Or do you say, six trillion dollars, give it to me or bust, and then meet somewhere around 3.5 trillion? That sort of thing happens. Um, that's a decent framing. What if we committed our energies instead to creating a world where we don't entrust the safety of black women, trans and gender non-conforming non people to institutions that report that nobody was injured in a home invasion that left Breonna Taylor bleeding to death? Oh yeah, that's a thing that happened. Or to people who describe the events of that night as legal, moral, and ethical. A world where the police department that killed her is no longer looting resources from the healthcare system she was proud to be an essential part of while violating and killing people who demand justice in her name. In other words, a world without police. What if the National Days of Action, billboards, sports team tributes, and celebrity statements, instead of demanding prosecutions that won't get us there, called for an end to the war on drugs, which is really a thinly veiled war on black and brown communities like Breonna's. That would bring us closer to a world where Br women like Breonna Taylor, Tarika Wilson, Katherine Johnst Johnston, and Alberta Spruill would no longer be continuing casualties of militarized police raids. A world where women like Frankie Ann Perkins would no longer be choked to death by police in broad daylight, like George Floyd on the suspicion that they swallow drugs. A world where we invest in strategies around drug use and sales that save lives instead of taking them. 
like voluntary, accessible, and universally available harm reduction programs that don't mobilize the threat of punishment, but instead offer support in all the forms it is needed for as long as it is needed. Yes. Amen, jeez. What if our outrage at Brianna's murder extended to demanding a world where officers like Brett Hankinson aren't empowered by their position to engage in sexual harassment and assault? Whether in the context of the war on drugs, traffic stops, and broken windows policing like Holtzclaw, or under the pretext of offering assistance like Hankinson. A world where women like Charnesia Corley aren't subjected to state-sanctioned rape through an 11-minute forcible body cavity search in full public view because an officer claimed to have caught a whiff of marijuana during a traffic stop or rolling through a stop sign on the way to store to the store to pick up medicine for her grandmother. Sorry, just... Mm. It gets to you. Yeah. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, and, and nothing... Nothing happens when this when these events happen. Where black women can travel safely without fear that they will be strip searched, their breasts scroped, or their genitals probed when they land. What if our indignation at the state's failure to hold the officers who killed Breonna Taylor accountable led to demands like those enshrined in the Movement for Black Lives Breathe Act to defund police as a systemic form of accountability for what is in fact a systemic problem. Defunding police offers more expansive and more effective accountability, ensuring that neither cops who kill nor those who come after them will be able to do harm in the future. It also points us toward a world where the hundred billion dollars we currently invest in policing every year would by, be diverted to quality, affordable, accessible, sustainable, and affirming housing, public spaces, health care, education, jobs, and community-based violence prevention and intervention strategies. Yeah, I guess... The Breathe Act also calls for accountability in the form of reparations for survivors of police violence, families of people killed by police, and communities, inviting us to apply the framework of the historic struggle for justice for survivors of police violence in Chicago to current demands for accountability and seek holistic repair of individual and collective harms of police violence. Beyond Chicago's victories, a reparations framework would provide for immediate cessation of harm through termination of all cops involved in perpetrating it, and non-repetition through termination of the policing that requires it. I wish we even had real stats on, stats on police violence and not just murder. Right. Um, we have very, very loose data on it. It is still an astoundingly high number but it's also incomplete because like even in the case of Breonna Taylor they just wrote the report that said nobody was injured even though somebody died and if the report is not challenged that is what goes on the official record we have no idea how many people are getting injured or murdered by police or sexually assaulted by police. Um, and we have no way of in investigating that. Many police departments, I believe most, uh, don't even allow public inquiry of complaints that have been filed against officers. 
Um, which that seems weird. Um, as police always like to say, if you haven't done anything wrong, why are you hiding this? Um, that by itself is a flawed argument, but that is the argument that they make. And it does make one wonder why so many police departments refuse um, public inquiry of investigating those complaints. Privatization is shrinking. How many police that's available? For? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about violence against black women in a world without police? Our calculus when answering this question must include all forms of violence, recognizing that black women currently experience significant violence at the hands of police and very little protection. Black women's safety requires us to build a world where black women are not killed, violently arrested, sexually assaulted, or deported by police, or abandoned to be killed or harmed by someone else. A world where women like Aura Rosser, Janisha Fonville, and Kiwi Herring aren't killed by police responding to calls for assistance. And where Mia Green, a black trans woman allegedly killed by a man she was in a relationship with, would still be with us. A world where survivors like Cassandra Jackson, a black woman violently arrested, manhandled, handcuffed to a chair, placed in restraints, and incarcerated away from her children for days, for simply expressing frustration that she was unable to obtain an order of protection, aren't subjected to more violence from the very institutions looting resources from the things they desperately need to prevent, escape, and avoid violence. Yeah. If instead of, like, so many prisons, we had shelters for abuse victims, we had rehab centers, we had shelters for people who were, you know, currently houseless, that, af that afforded them some sort of standard of living where they could get back on their feet. If we had these sorts of things, these sorts of women wouldn't get into these, you know, wouldn't be trapped in these sorts of situations and have actually no one they can look to for protection. What if our demands to protect, defend, and value black women did not call for more policing and prosecutions, fueling a system we cannot and do not trust with our safety because it targets us? Over 40% of domestic violence survivors and 75% of rape and sexual assault survivors don't call the police. Those are hard statistics. Over 40% of domestic violence survivors and 75% of rape and sexual assault survivors do not call the police. I've harped on this many times, how the system is not set up to take sexual assault seriously. Um, and that it tends to be much more traumatic for the victim, while not actually effectively handling the perpetrator. Um, and offers no real protection to the victim in many cases, especially in a situation where the victim doesn't necessarily have financial means of their own and are enduring it because of, you know, they're financially reliant on the one attacking them. Or, who knows, there's, ven there's many other reasons. A lot of it is as was mentioned up above, when they call cops for help, sometimes they get attacked by the police. Way too often. Um, let's see. Perhaps the way policing happens is part of it. The police know 
more than any of us that they act in a purely reactive way and borderline incompetent way. So they know that when they act in a questionable manner, exactly what the reaction will be, no matter the outrage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Shalin, I, yeah, I think that's basically the foundation of Abolish the Police, the system itself. Setting aside any individual or societal bias. It's, yeah. Um, the, the system itself incentivizes police to abuse their power. It does. There's no disincentive to it. And... Yeah. Okay. For every black woman who reports her rape, at least 15 do not. Two-thirds of black trans respondents in the U.S. Transgender Survey said they would be uncomfortable asking for help from the police if they needed it, in spite of epidemic levels of physical, sexual, and fatal violence targeting trans women. 66% there. Of... Both groups cite fears that they will not be believed or will experience further violence and criminalization by cops. Almost a third of respondents to a national survey of advocates and service providers reported that police used force and threatened to arrest or arrested survivors, noting that these tactics were disproportionately mobilized against black women. None of this can be reformed away. In fact, reforms attempted to date, like mandatory arrest policies requiring officers to arrest someone when they respond to domestic violence calls, have resulted in increased arrests of black women and girls who are survivors because the system operates through controlling narratives that frame us as deserving of and contributing to violence against us and unworthy of protection. Between people I know directly or have read about online, literally never heard even a neutral experience of reporting sexual assault to police authorities. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, tends not to be beneficial ever. <laughs> And mind you, this is this is after the whole Me Too movement. Like that, I mean, it's still going on, but it's like the awareness and the visibility is there. But this is so deeply entrenched into the policing system and into society that violence against women like this is normalized and it cannot be accepted. We can end this war on black women, but that victory will never be achieved through prosecutions or police reform. It requires us to invest in the things survivors need to prevent, avoid, escape, and transform conditions of violence. Black Lives Matter Louisville's demands for justice in Breonna Taylor's name have shifted over time to reflect these realities. From focusing on arrests of officers involved and eliminating or elimination of no knock warrants, to tackling systemic forces of gentrification that contributed to Brianna's murder, dismantling the department that killed her, and securing investments in institutions that would make her community safer, like ecosystems of healthcare workers, universally accessible and affordable housing, universal basic income and community conflict resolution training. They mirror a similar evolution across the country in the context of the current uprising against police violence in calls to defund police.
The In Our Names Network, made up of over 20 organizations and individuals working to end police violence against black women, girls, trans, and gender non-conforming people, has followed a similar path. From demanding justice in individual cases of police violence to simultaneously working towards systemic responses that would have prevented them from happening in the first place. For instance, every black girl founded in the wake of assault at Spring Valley High is creating safety for black girls in and out of the classroom, including fighting for police free schools. Along with our network members, they will train black youth as researchers to document sexual harassment and violence by cops stationed in and around schools to show that police presence in schools makes students less safe, not more. If you're interested in more about that, there is an earlier essay in this series all about policing in the classroom and how it makes schools less safer and in fact, sets many students up, particularly black students, for starting their carceral life early, basically. Oakland's Anti-Police Terror Project, which organized around police killings of Yvette Henderson and Jessica Williams, is building black-led prevention and intervention responses to unmet mental health needs that prioritize avoiding police involvement and psychiatric incarceration. Programs like this could prevent up to half of police killings of black people who are or are perceived to be in a mental health crisis. Network member Maria Moore is fighting for justice on behalf of her sister Kayla Moore, a black trans woman killed by police by working toward a 24-hour non-police mental health crisis response in Berkeley. Network members Solutions Not Punishment Collaborative, Tamika Spellman of HIPS, uh, Monica Jones of The Outlaw Project, BYP100, and Black LGBTQ, LGBTQIA Plus Migrant Project are working to build safety for black trans women from police, migration related, and community violence. I am still working on compiling a list of some of these organizations that have been mentioned not only in this essay, but in previous essays, in case anyone wants more information about them or wants to volunteer or donate to them. So that is coming to the Discord in the in the near future. Organizations like Insight teach us that expanding the lens through which we examine police violence and gender-based violence to include black women, trans and gender non-conforming people's experiences leads us much more quickly to abolition. It helps us to see how policing black women whose labor is deemed essential, but whose lives and safety are not, is at the core of the criminal punishment system, whether we are targets of police or seeking protection. It also helps us to see how other institutions offered as alternatives to police, like the family court and foster system, medical industrial complex, and social services can operate as soft police controlling and criminalizing black women, queer and trans people through denial of care, benefits, resources, and protection. This is especially true of, um, of trans people. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, especially depending on, you know, states in, in red states, you hear very frequently about medical services being denied to individuals who need it. If they happen to be non-white, non, you know, gender conforming um, or gender non-conforming or what have you. Um, not on any good grounds, just excuses get found, uh, especially in 
uh, child protective services and such as that, family court, foster care. Um, I know some people do still find this case to be controversial, but I do like to bring it up because I do think it still counts as a clear problem of policing and as a clear example of this. Um, Makaya Bryant was someone who survived a great deal of abuse through the foster system and could never get any sort of protection from that abuse. It was reported and documented and nothing happened. Um, it led to a situation where in responding to a threat of more abuse against herself and her sisters, she raised a knife against someone, and in a split moment, she was gunned down with lethal force. Entirely avoidable. Entirely avoidable. If we took reports of this sort of violence seriously and had support structures in place, she could have gotten out of an abusive household and could have gotten care that she needed. And that situation would never have happened. The Interrupting Criminalization Initiative I co-founded with CABA is identifying women and LGBTQ people's point of contact with all forms of policing so as to interrupt and eliminate them. We work collaboratively with groups across the country to document the criminalization of black women, girls, trans, and gender non-conforming people, decriminalize, divert, decarcerate, divest, and dismantle and dream a world without policing, in which everything we need to be safe is universally and, acce and accessibly available. The goal is to reduce police contact and, as Kaba often puts it, to multiply the options available to survivors to access safety and transform harm. That is what Say Her Name means to me. Not just making sure we know Breonna Taylor's name, but understanding the forces that converged to kill her. Divesting financially, ideologically, and emotionally from the systems that perpetrated and justify her death. And directing our energies toward building a world where black women are safe, in her name and in honor of her life. It means understanding that the value of our lives is not set by the amount of time a person does in a cage for hurting us, but by the ways in which we organize to keep each other safe. Kaba and Herzing teach us that the tools for abolition are in our hands, and we can practice them every day, in every interaction, institution, and imagining we engage in. We each have a role in bringing us closer to a world where Brianna would still be with us. Let's put all of our collective energies into getting there. Yes. It was the 26th essay of Abolition for the People, Ending the War on Black Women by Andrea Ritchie. Very, very good one. And a very clear articulation of what abolition is and the traps that we can kind of mentally fall into to perpetuate the current system rather than demanding more when we can demand more. Um, yes, I do these once a week. Uh, there are only four more. Um, so, um, yeah. Let's go ahead and transition here.